The national security team the president met with this morning advised the president and vice president that another terror attack in Kabul is likely. Uh, and they are uh, taking maximum force protection measures at the Kabul airport and in the surrounding areas with our forces uh, as a result. As you heard, the U.S. is warning there will likely be more attacks targeting the airport in Kabul. The number of dead in yesterday's suicide bombings has reportedly grown to 170. That does not include the 13 U.S. service members who were killed in the blast. Two British nationals and a child of a British national were also killed. Yet the U.K. is also preparing to wrap up its evacuation efforts at the airport. Tom Tugendhat is a British Conservative MP. He serves as chair of the U.K. Foreign Affairs Committee, and he served for the British Army in Afghanistan. Tom Tukenhat, you have a, a deep connection with what is unfolding in Afghanistan. Just for our viewers, can you just tell them a little bit of your backstory? Sure. Well, I started in Afghanistan in 2005, and uh, I spent the first year helping to set up the National Security Council in Kabul. I then spent the second year helping to set up the first non-warlord government in Helmand, supporting the governor of Helmand. And I then spent two years on combat operations with my old unit, um, mostly in Helmand, but alongside uh, the PPLI as well in Kandahar and uh, serving at various points under and alongside Canadian troops. So it's, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be with you, but it's um, a very sad day. Are there people there that you've been in contact with who were unable to get out? Uh, there are many people who I am still in contact with who have been unable to get out and who I'm still trying to get out. I'm extremely disappointed with where we find ourselves, but I have not given up. And there are options that we now have to explore. They're worse options. They're more dangerous options. They're options I wish we weren't having to take. But if the alternative is uh, to be slowly hunted down and killed, then they are options that we must look into. Well, let's explore that a bit, because Boris Johnson said that, quote, uh, that you'd move heaven and earth to help people uh, who the UK cannot evacuate. So do, do you have an idea of what that looks like? I, I don't at the moment, but uh, I know that uh, many conversations are being had as to how we can get support from uh, regional powers, regional neighbours, uh, to make sure that we have uh, ways of supporting exit routes through, uh, you know, Islamabad, Tashkent, wherever it may be. Um, Let's see what works out, because regional powers are playing, uh, you know, have their own interests and have their own uh, challenges. And so we need to we need to see who's able to help and how. Do you have an opinion as to who might be uh, most reliable for that? I, I don't want to say at the moment because um, we're still exploring options. I'm in a lot of conversations with, as you can imagine, with um, uh, former colleagues in the military uh, and some of these armies. I've worked with personally and I still have good connections to others. Uh, I have parliamentary connections to from the Foreign Affairs Committee that I chair. And then there are others where I'm just dealing with our embassies and seeing seeing what we can do. On a personal level, and you touched on that at the beginning of our conversation, when you see this, this rapid and frankly brutal deterioration uh, unfolding in Afghanistan, in Kabul in particular, uh, so many thousands trapped. Uh, you talked about your sadness. Uh, just give me a, a deeper understanding of how this is affecting you and, and people like you who have a deep connection to the country. Well, look, I had a great privilege of uh, being uh, in Latvia the other day and um, saw some of your guys from the <clears throat> 22e Regiment. And um, one of the extraordinary things is you can you can see the Afghan vets. You recognize each other in a funny way. And we were talking about it. And in other parts of uh, the UK, I've been talking to uh, people who've served. And I've had many, many emails and messages from Canadians and Americans and Australians and indeed Dutch and Danes and others in recent days. And we're all feeling pretty bruised um, because the events that we've seen in the last few days and weeks have torn open some pretty raw wounds and have left a lot of us hurting. So it's been a tough time. And um, what can I say? We need to we need to get the right answer for our partners and our friends. We need to do our best for the country. You know, uh, some po politicians may have given up fighting, but we haven't. Uh, many politicians have suggested that no one saw it coming, certainly not at the speed in which it happened. Uh, 
Do you agree that it was impossible to predict the rapidity of uh, this chaos? Well, I, I mean, it, I think had you had you assumed that the only thing we were doing was stepping back, then that would have been true. But we didn't just step back. Um, in leaving Bagram Airport, we also removed the contractors who sustained the Afghan air fleet. We removed the enablers who supported the Afghan uh, logistics chain. You know, it it wasn't just two and a half thousand U.S. troops. It was the you know, the entire backbone. Uh, and so, frankly, I'm not astonished at the speed it collapsed. I'm astonished at the length of time that so many of these incredibly brave people carried on fighting, despite the fact they were running out of ammunition, despite the fact that they weren't being fed, despite the fact that they weren't being paid, and and knew that behind them, you know, their their leadership was collapsing. So I have to say, I have nothing but um, praise for the extraordinary courage of so many Afghan troops. Is that to say you, you think what we're witnessing was entirely predictable or at least partially predictable? It, it wasn't just predictable, it was predicted. Right. And yet we have uh, leaders of countries saying that it surprised them. Well, uh, there's an old joke in intelligence that it's not an intelligence failure if you haven't read the intelligence. Okay, so clearly you're not buying it, and here we are now. Uh, and we have all these commitments that we're hearing from Joe Biden, from uh, the prime minister of this country, the prime minister of your country, saying that even though uh, the, the end of the mission happens on the 31st, uh, when the Americans are fully withdrawn, that the effort to get people out will continue. Uh, what confidence should people have in those assurances and those public commitments? Well, I hope very much that uh, we'll be able to have a lot of confidence that we will keep trying. But let's also recognize the reality, which is that you spoke at the beginning here, Kathleen, about the fact that, you know, these awful scenes in, in Kabul. You didn't talk about the awful scenes that we're seeing in Herat or Kandahar or Lashkagar uh, or Tarankot. I can run through many other cities. And the reason you didn't talk about it is because we don't have any journalists there, mm. because there's no coverage there. So... The death squads that are going house to house in Kandahar, killing those people who stood by us. And I don't just mean police officers and soldiers. I also mean teachers and civil servants, people who worked for women's rights, people who worked in girls' education. You know, we're not reporting that. And we're not reporting that because it's too dangerous. I don't blame journalists for not being there. If they were there, they'd be killed too. But that's the reality of defeat. We, we cease to be able to control events on the ground. And so what we're talking about, I hope, as prime ministers and presidents around the world and what we're listening to, those good words and those encouragements, I hope we, we work to make them real. But the reality is our level of influence, our level of, you know, our points of leverage are much, much weaker than I think many people realize. Because I'm afraid defeat is, I mean, defeat is when you don't have any choices. Defeat is when you can't help. What is the legacy for NATO? and all of the uh, forces that contributed to uh, the war, the mission, however it's been described in various ways over the last two decades. What's the legacy? Well, there are two legacies. One is this is a hell of a punch in the face for uh, NATO in the sense that it, it looks like what it is. The second is, however, a step of hope, which is, NATO did work together extremely capably on its first major operation, its first and only Article 5 operation, and demonstrated its interoperability extremely effectively. What we've now got to do is remember that interoperability is not the same as dependence. And so we've got to build up the platform of NATO partners to make sure that we work together and that we have many, many points of interaction and don't have just a single point like a, you know, we're not just like a, a wagon wheel with a single point in the middle, but we're actually like a fishing net and all tied together in many different ways, because that's how we'll make ourselves strong again. And at the moment, we seem to have, we seem to have over-centralized. So I'm looking forward to deepening NATO alliances uh, in Europe, across the Atlantic with Canada, uh, and indeed bringing others in in different ways, Japan, Australia, perhaps India in some ways too to make sure that our interaction, that our support networks and our strength comes from our network and not just from having a single powerful ally. 
Tom Tugan had good of you to take the time and provide your unique insight. Thank you. Thank you.